Hello, everybody. Happy spring, I hope, where you are or when you're uh, watching. It's, uh, yes. Wow, spring equinox was last week. I can't believe it. Um, so tonight is kind of a little different, um, not a usual kind of just a short Dharma talk and a meditation. It's a little bit more of a an overview of the path in a kind of a chart form to help uh, some folks, some minds like mine, like to see things visually or see things in a list, you know, because sometimes we can just like each week pull out some different little nugget of Dharma. And it's kind of like, where does that fit in in this whole mm, path of awakening and uh so um this was a, a helpful request that came from someone in the sangha and um so i couldn't find what i wanted that you you can find parts of this but like to really break it further um into the whole eightfold path uh, so i made my own and uh so we're going to just kind of uh, go through it and give a little bit more context. And um, I think folks can also pop questions into the chat and it probably won't show up on the screen. I think that's happened before. I don't really use it much, but if, if something comes up when we're on here, um, you can try and use the chat and we'll see how that goes. Ah. Let me just see if I need to. No. Okay. So I'm going to uh, screen share, I hope, uh, this little chart and I'll figure out a way to make it bigger too. Uh -huh. Okay. Here it is. All right. So let me just zoom in and make it bigger here. Oh, look at that. Fabulous. So hopefully you can. Um, see it well enough and ha don't do that whatever that was that i just did i probably just erased the whole thing <laughs> what happened oh my god <laughs> dharma wait a sec that would be just fierce if that happened let me try i'm zoomed in at the bottom whatever does that mean let me just see. Sorry, folks. Tech whiz. When you were screen sharing. Okay. Let me try it again. Screen share. It just really zoomed in. <laughs> okay. Let me see if I can find it now. New. Not that. Okay, one sec. I'm going to just go back to my documents and see if I can pull it up because I closed it. Equal path, flowchart PDF, open. Yes, baby. Happy. Try again. All right, screen share. Thank you, Michael. Here we are. All right. Zoom in a little bit. So here we are. The blue bar on the left says the Four Noble Truths and the Middle Way. The Middle Way is a, a term to describe the Fourth Noble Truth. So I've separated it out here because the fourth noble truth has a lot in it and that's what we're kind of breaking breaking down here so just to start here with the four noble truths there's four of them in blue the first one is the ennobling or hmm, enlightening truth that the buddha awoke to the truth of dukkha i've used the pali word dukkha here because 
the translations into English are, is there a nicer way to say inadequate, uh, are not comprehensive enough. That was nicer. So the truth of Dukkha is the understanding that part of this life experience includes suffering. Unless one is fully enlightened and awakened, most of us are experiencing at times a rising and passing of stress, pain, discomfort, not liking, loss of what we love, or what we want to keep, aging, sickness, death, that, you know, there's all the ways that we um, experience dukkha. We also, of course, experience joy and love and peace and calm and happiness, equanimity. And so the Buddha did not say life is suffering, as is often misquoted, and uh, he didn't say that all of life is suffering, but part of the the experience of this um, incarnation ex includes dukkha. The second noble truth that the Buddha awoke to is that uh, dukkha has a cause that causes it to arise. It has an origin or a cause. And that cause or origin is craving. In Pali, this is the word tanha, T-A-N-H-A, which means thirst in its literal translation. And uh, another part of the definition of tanha or craving is, is um, in the Pali English dictionary, it says the fever of unsatisfied longing. It's such a great description, this fever of wanting things to be other than how they are or wanting to keep things how they are. So when something's pleasant and how we like it and how we want it to be, we have the, this craving for it to stay. And when things are unpleasant and painful, we have the fever of unsatisfied longing for it to not be how it is. The third noble truth is that if there is a cause for anything to arise, when there's a cause, if you take away the cause, it won't arise. So it will, or it will cease. So it's the ending or the cessation of dukkha is possible when we don't crave and cling. And the fourth noble truth is the way to the ending or cessation of dukkha. Okay, so we've got truth of dukkha, its cause, clinging, it's possible for it to end. And the fourth is the eightfold noble path or the way to the ending of dukkha. And then you can see uh, this little <laughs> line here is indicating that this is what's being broken down in the rest of the chart is the way or the eightfold middle path. Should I make it a bit bigger maybe? Um, okay. So I've color coded these to green, orange, and purple. And then there's a little legend. The green ones are what are called the wisdom factors. So the Eightfold Path is broken into three groupings. The green ones are called the wisdom factors. The orange are the ethical conduct or sila. And the purple ones are the mental discipline or the samadhi groupings. And 
don't worry about that too much. It's kind of an aside. It's it's slightly relevant, but um, you don't have to try to remember that. <clears throat> so the first of these eightfold, the eightfold path to the ending of Dukkha is wise view here in green. Mm, some different translations use slightly different labels for these. Wise view is um, is good. <laughs> There's two main aspects of wise view. The first is knowing and having some understanding of the Four Noble Truths, which is what we're talking about now and what was just like super briefly mm, outlined there. So you're already on the path of wise view, you know, and there's, we'll talk about this part later, but uh, so it's, it's having some knowledge of and even if one doesn't have the language or hasn't studied the Dharma, even if uh, you know, you've never come across any of this before, if someone has the experience of some awareness of mental pain, <laughs> that gets added to life's experiences. There's a little bit of awareness of watching, wow, this is a lot of suffering. I'm so wrapped up in this. Not just mental, but also added to physical experiences, etc. And and then they also have some awareness that, oh, peaceful, or oh, that let go. Or that's not still so fiery. Or, oh, when these conditions are present, there's a sense of inner peace. So this is somebody that has a little bit of a touch of wise view, even if they haven't experienced Dharma. So the Four Noble Truths is the first aspect of wise view. And the second one is, it bothers me that it's Sanskrit there, is Kama. K-A-M-M-A -M -M -A is the Pali word. And in Sanskrit, that's translated into Karma. I put Karma there because most people have, are more familiar with that version. Mm. So Karma here is on the most basic level the understanding that our intentions our thought our speech and our actions all have an effect they all create ripples it's like a still pond with pebbles dropped into it it creates ripples and every, every thought, speech, action, even intention has an effect. It affects our future moments. Whatever is arising in this moment is conditioned and affects next moments. It can affect other people. It can be affecting the, the world, the environment. Uh, and likewise, everyone else's actions and speech and thoughts are also dropping pebbles and those ripples are affecting us. So we're also being affected by cause and cause and response, cause and um, cause and effect. That was the word I was looking for. Um, this is one aspect of Kama. The, the other um, wider, deeper ripple 
of Kama is the of how all of these conditions and effects also condition not just future moments, but future incarnations or rebirths, rebecoming, which is a whole a whole thing. Maybe I'll have to do that next week and talk about that. Haha. <laughs> Or maybe not. <laughs> I might avoid that a bit longer. Okay. Let's go to the second of the Eightfold Path. Or the middle way it's called that the Buddha awoke to. Which is wise intention. This has three parts to it. I, I couldn't list them like down so I put the numbers with them because it just was going all the way off the page it was too long so you see renunciation here and then non-ill will and non-harming it's not that it's not that non-ill will is a subcategory of renunciation it's just that how I could fit it on the page so that's why I added the numbers like that okay so Hmm. Why is intention? See, intention uh, of, it comes before every act of speech. Intention comes before every action. Intention even comes before hmm. so cultivating wise intention is like the a, a very important ground for skillfulness. And so these three intentions of renunciation, non-ill will, and non-harm are like really basic ways to take care of each other and to take care of ourselves and our own minds and nervous system because when we act with greed hatred and delusion we are disturbed and then we can't meditate very well and we also um it will have effects in our speech and actions and be causing more harm etc so basically renunciation if these are in the Dharma, they're phrased in the negative. And so if we also want to look at that in the positive, renunciation would be generosity. Um, so it's not and letting go. And it, it it's a huge, deep topic, very important part of the path, renunciation. Um, but in short, you could just think of it as generosity. Non-ill will in the positive would be metta, loving kindness, friendliness, benevolence, which is a meditative practice, but also a way of being and living in the world. Non-ill will or non-hatred. And the third one here, non-harm is is karuna to be not not causing suffering in our actions or speech is uh, compassion yeah not harming so not uh not thinking uh, ill will or hatred thoughts towards people and also not causing harm Hmm. Okay, the third part of this middle path, Eightfold Noble Path, which is a breakdown of the Fourth Noble Truth. So I'm just repeating it so we can start to get that system, is wise speech. And we can see that these next ones are this orange color, as I've highlighted them, which means they're part of the sila or ethical conduct 
wise speech includes these four aspects. Again, they're not subcategories. It's just how I was able to fit them on the page. So the first is not lying. The second is not divisive speech. The third is not abusive speech. And the fourth is not idle chatter. <laughs> so um, in the positive, not lying means telling the truth. These are in relation to each other. So if by telling, the, you know, it doesn't just mean like these aren't commandments. These are things that require discernment. So we've done other talks that you can find on the YouTube channel just around why speech and all of these parts are all on there. But, you know, if, if I say, you know, oh, I just always have to tell the truth no matter what, but telling the truth causes harm to someone or is, is hurtful um, or is divisive, then that requires discernment. Is it the right time? Is it helpful? Is it going to be received? You know, these kind of things is there's a whole lot to explore around why speech. Okay, the second part, not divisive means like not slander, not, you know, uh, trying to, to divide people in our speech. And uh, so not abusive would, would mean just kind speech, not, you know, not putting people down, not yelling, not, uh, yeah, abusing folks with our speech. No, number four, not idle chatter means, it, that means gossip. It means, mm, you know, it, it means, uh, probably TikTok, it probably means, uh, <laughs> you know, to, to look at what, how much speech that's really not conducive to wisdom or peace or um, compassion. Is it just idle chatter and inane and, and not fruitful? Then that's, would be um not wise not wise speech um so so speech should be truthful friendly but also benevolent or meaningful useful careful full of care and also at the right time and place and also, silence. Silence is good. Very good. If you're not sure, just wait. Be silent for a little while. Uh, we sometimes can be a bit too quick. All right. I hope this isn't going on too long for you. Um, <clears throat> the fourth the Eightfold Path is wise action. And um, in the Dharma, this is three particular things, uh, not killing, not stealing, and not sexual misconduct. <clears throat> the wording is awkward here because I had to shorten them so much just to give you a little flavor of what they mean. <clears throat> <clears throat> They're pretty self-explanatory, but they are also nuanced. You know, not stealing. It can be as subtle as like, well, leaving the water running when you brush your teeth. <laughs> like, am I taking more water than I need? It can be as simple as something like that, like mm, not taking more resources than I need. You know, that's a, there's lots of subtlety in here to explore. 
Yeah. <clears throat> Number five of the sila grouping of this eightfold path is wise livelihood. And there's these five that are uh, mm, expounded uh, to not be dealing in weapons, not selling weapons. So any any participation in war and violence and um, weaponry is not considered a wise livelihood. Not dealing in living beings. So this means slavery. It means... Uh, um, like uh what's the word you know forced labor and and uh child labor and all these kind of things where we're we're making a profit from uh harming living beings <clears throat> or the sale sale of of living beings um what it is also um Not selling meat is also considered um, part of wise livelihood. I didn't mean to zoom in there, zoom out. Okay, there we are. Not, not, um, not killing is part of uh, above, not killing. So not killing animals and selling their meat. Uh, not selling intoxicants is also um, part of wise livelihood. I think it was mostly it's mostly it in in the original suttas is listed as alcohol. Um, now we have so many fabulous intoxicants. There's, the list could go on, and um, some of us might include our. Um, smartphones as an intoxicant <clears throat> i'd love to know what the buddha would think of that uh and then the last wise livelihood is to not be selling poisons you know if, if, i wonder if they had such things then you know of um like the poisons for the, the that are poisoning the earth also poisoning each other, humans, but the earth itself, poisoning the water, poisoning the, the soil, etc. Okay. Well, this is longer than I thought. Sorry, folks. I hope you're okay. Um, number six of the eightfold middle path. Now we're into the uh, samadhi grouping or the mental discipline cultivation. And here we're into wise effort, one of my favorite topics. There's four wise efforts, and they're super important and applicable in daily life, absolutely, and in meditation formal practice. So the first one is preventing the arising of unskillful mental states. So the first is prevention, and then the second is when unskillfulness has arisen to abandon it. And each of these have ways of how we do that. And there's Dharma talks on YouTube about each of these as well. So when unskillfulness has arisen, like greed, hatred, and delusion, or sloth and torpor, or restlessness, or any of the five hindrances, then there are ways that we or should employ to abandon unskillfulness. <clears throat> and then on the other aspect, we also want to cultivate what is skillful, onward leading, wholesome, mm, conducive to wisdom and peace. So we want to cultivate what is skillful and, and that goes into our meditation practice, etc. And then when skillfulness has arisen, we want to maintain it, to um, let it become steady, to really, uh, yeah, maintain what is skillful. 
It's a great topic, lots to learn about there. All right. And then number seven is wise mindfulness. Isn't it so interesting that the Eightfold Path, the whole meditation path, has all of this to it that we've already, like, you know, we're just listing. This is just like, there's so much. And then there's wise mindfulness comes in. You know, it, the, sometimes we think the whole thing is just meditating, just mindfulness. I just need to, just need to sit down and be quiet and meditate. And you can see it's just a piece of a big, way of living and cultivating a heart mind that is conducive to awakening and is a safe uh, being in the world for other people etc okay so here we are wise mindfulness and ah uh, so much here so these are just the four foundations of mindfulness that I've listed here. The first is mindfulness of body. The second is, I could put feeling tone, but again, I'd rather put the Pali word here, which is Vedana, V-E-D-E-N-A, <clears throat> because it means something very specific. It doesn't mean your emotions. Vedana, or feeling tone, as it's sometimes called, just refers to the bare contact through our sense doors before liking and not liking and spacing out. It just means things are pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral. And that's a whole Dharma talk. Okay, number three, the third foundation of mindfulness is mindfulness of mind. And mindfulness of mind doesn't mean just mindfulness of my thinking. Oh, the thoughts, wonderful thoughts. Let's think about the thoughts. It It's very specific, and it refers to particularly being aware of the categories of the flavor of thoughts. Greed, hatred, and delusion. It also refers to knowing when the mind is contracted or uncontracted, meaning sloth and torpor or restlessness. Um, it, it means uh, understanding when the mind is developed or undeveloped and concentrated or unconcentrated. So these, this is what mindfulness of mind is in the third foundation. I, I imagine this must be very overwhelming, but maybe not. Okay, the fourth foundation of mindfulness is the dhammas. <laughs> mindfulness of the dhammas, or sometimes called phenomenon. And uh, this is like many of the lists in dharma that you've heard of, the, like the five hindrances five aggregates, the six sense spaces, the seven factors of awakening, and the four noble truths. So this is a whole category of understanding the nature of things and how all of this uh, experience is actually coming to be. So the first foundation here, mindfulness of body, is um, the primary place for us to practice. And it includes so much. One of these is mindfulness of the breath, is one aspect of mindfulness of body. Also mindfulness of postures, whether we're standing, sitting, walking, laying down, being mindful of the body in whatever posture it's in. The third is a clear comprehension of the body, meaning continuous awareness through a day of what the body's doing. These hands are waving around, the mouth is moving, 
the eyes are seeing, breath is coming and going, so that when one is coming and going and lifting and sitting and moving, that there's clear comprehension of the body. Then it also includes uh, mindfulness of the elements, which we're going to do for Earth Day coming up. And uh, then there's the cemetery contemplations. There's nine of those, which are very important uh, uh, meditations on impermanence and death. And then there's another category on the repulsiveness of the body, which helps us to... Um, mm, release us from clinging to youth and beauty and attachment to the body. <laughs> oh dear. The last one, again, this is so interesting to me. The last here is wise concentration. This is the eighth of the eightfold middle path. And these are the jhanas. There's four jhana states, which I'm not going to go into. And, um, but again, many people come to meditation or to the path and they think they're starting with concentration. They think they're supposed to concentrate. I'm going to sit down and concentrate on the breath. And they're like, wow, I can't meditate. I'm no good at this. Let me go try Tai Chi or something. Because it, you don't start with concentration. We have to cultivate wise view, wise intention, ethics through our speech action the right efforts mindfulness to to cultivate some stability and and awareness eventually one might be able to cultivate some beginning access concentration how you doing i know totally going long. I didn't know it would take so long to even just describe these briefly. So I just want to mention this um, other question that came in about this. It was a very good question. Is this like a checklist? You know, because we're, we're used to this, like a list with numbers. Bada bing, bada boom. Like I got to start with wise view. When I got that, you know, is it is it a um, is there an order? Is it a, a a sequence? You know. And there's something to that in that I was just saying cultivating. Hmm these uh, wise intentions and understanding will help to have more stability to be able to actually meditate or practice wise mindfulness. Um, but mostly, no. <laughs> mostly, this is developed simultaneously because they all feed each other and deepen each other. They're, it's all interwoven, and I see it more like a, a deepening spiral. I did spend some time down the wormhole of different kinds of spirals today on Google. I'll spare you that, but um, like a spiral that continues to deepen so that if you were really, um, let me zoom out. <clears throat> you know, working with this practice for some time, you know, <clears throat> and after you've maybe cultivated some wise mindfulness or concentration, that will then deepen your wise view. You then have a deeper understanding of the Four Noble Truths and how important sila and ethics are. You know, and so it just keeps going round and round, but gets deeper and um, hmm, more all pervasive, maybe. Uh, so 
it 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 kind of circles on back to itself and deepens yeah <clears throat> So, <laughs> that's an overview of the Eightfold Path. <laughs> and in my deepest intention, I hope that um, you will let go of trying to get it trying to memorize it or trying to know it all. That's not necessary. Understand that the path is about dukkha and the ending of dukkha. And these are all the ways we can deepen and explore that to understand, is this adding to suffering? or ending suffering, what I'm thinking, what I'm doing, what I'm saying, creating more suffering or ending suffering. And these are all some of the ways. And it's helpful to have a teacher <laughs> to help you guide your practice. Um, Let's have a short practice. I really, really intended to have a longer practice with this and um, and I didn't know, I didn't know. So let's have some practice maybe. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll go over 8.30, like no, normally we end at 8.30 Eastern, but for, so for folks that uh, you need to sign off, of course, please do. Uh, let's have a 20 minute practice. If you need to leave, um, I understand, and my apologies for keeping you. Okay. That was so many words. <laughs> Let them all go as much as you can. can still feel all those words just swirling around and concepts and... So we just kind of expanded that fourth noble truth and then we just want to let it draw back into itself and understand, oh, there's so much to the way, the way to the ending of Dukkha. And that's what we're here to practice. So just let it settle or float away. And then we'll begin this practice by mm, connecting to the great support and the ethical foundation and underpinning of the practice. Some of us practice with these five precepts of our values or ethics that, that guide us every day. So take some time here as you're just landing, beginning to feel into what your intentions and values are. To undertake the training to refrain from harm or taking life or the destruction of life. To take up this training to refrain from taking what isn't freely given. Reaffirm your intention to refrain from harm in the areas of sensual desires.
Reaffirm your intention to refrain from speaking falsely or harmfully. And touch into reconnect with your intention to refrain from intoxicating substances, intoxicants that cause carelessness or heedlessness. And feel how you are supported by your values, your ethics, your less disturbed. Let these ethics hold you in your wise intentions right now. And then the first foundation of wise mindfulness is mindfulness of the body. Feel the body present, grounded, relaxing, softening. And just to open to the field of sensations here in this posture that you're in, whether sitting, standing, lying, or walking. There's sensations of pressure, contact, temperature, textures movements, contractions, vibrations, so much. Mindfulness of body in this posture. And in this field of wise mindfulness of body, you could stay just with the sensations of the body in this posture that you're in, or you could rest now, begin to pay attention to the breath. Body is already breathing. See where you feel the sensation of breath most clearly or place you usually practice. Might be the sensation of the chest rising and falling. Or the belly expanding, contracting.
or the passage of air at the nostrils. Slightly cooler on the inhale, warmed by the body on the exhale. Just choose one of these three places that feels most accessible to you. And then we'll return to that place, rest with that sensation. And remembering the aspect of wise effort that when we notice hmm, the mind is ruminating on something or sleepy, slipped into some torpor or, hmm, or even aspects of ill will or whatever, we want to be aware when we're caught and then let it go and begin again, feel this breath or this body sensation. We want to abandon what's unskillful and cultivate what's skillful. Wise mindfulness includes the awareness that what you're paying attention to, breath or body sensation, is conditioned, affected by many other conditions. It's impermanent, arising and passing. And it's not a reliable source of anything to be clung to because it's conditioned and impermanent. And we rest back a little further, rest back into awareness. It's just watching a rising, passing sensation. Awareness of awareness.
part of wise mindfulness is just gently naming an awareness of restlessness when it's present or sloth and torpor or doubt, desire and aversion. But we can just recognize any tendencies or habits that are showing up and then begin again this breath or this sensation. Maybe we can very lightly recognize if there's an absence of dukkha or if there's a presence, if the, is there any craving? Wanting to think about a certain thing or feel a certain way. Just recognize, hmm, this is dukkha. Cultivate kind and wise effort and gently begin again feeling this breath or this sensation. And we'll end with a few metta phrases to cultivate that non-ill will. May I be happy. Happy here means sukha, which is the opposite of dukkha. May I be happy. May I be safe and protected from unskillful mind states which cause harm to myself and others. May I be safe. May I be well, 
your body and mind. Not causing harm to the body and mind through unskillfulness. May I be well. And may I be peaceful. May I be free from dukkha. Thank you for joining us on this practice. I hope it was helpful for you to see a little bit of where things land in the path. And um, I think I think almost all of these topics, you can find individual Dharma talks and practices on the YouTube channel um, from myself and other teachers. Um, uh, so you can dive more deeply into all of them. Thanks for joining us.